to worship, who came all glorious above, gratefully sing his wonderful love, our shield and defender of the ancient of days, pavilion in splendor and girded with praise. There's a lot of big words in there. Here's the idea. My ways are not your ways, says the Lord. I am higher above the heavens, higher above the earth, higher than the earth. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Here's what the Apostle John writes in the book of 1 John. He says, This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you, God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him, and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his Son, purifies us from all unrighteousness.
Jesus, you have made us to be salt and light to the nations of the earth. As your people, we bear your name wherever we go. Thank you. But it's not up to us to perform well, to earn what you've given to us. It's not up for us to win this battle. Our salvation is not dependent on how well we fight, but how you have won. How you have had victory over our ancient enemy, death. And that you are working through all things in this world to bring an end to evil, to suffering, help us to live in the light of this new kingdom. Thank you for this morning. May you be pleased with our worship. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, let's take our seats together. Well, good morning. We really filled up. I wasn't sure how full this, uh, this place would be when we first started. team to pray for him and uh, we can all be praying that he's really clear he's he's helping uh, this biblical counseling uh, group there in Ukraine of course he's also visiting his two daughters who are missionaries there and um, many of us know them very well so he's not here this morning uh, Tom Bacon is preaching for us very looking forward to hearing him preach on the way the truth and the life this next I am statement from the book of John well two announcements that I have the first one is that on Thanksgiving morning, we did not do this last year because of COVID going on, but there's the turkey trot here at the YMCA. And it's a, it's a run, I think it's a 5K, maybe a 10K as well. Um, we as a church don't get together and run. If you want to run, that's awesome. What we do is we hand out cold water to the finishers. We have these beautiful water bottles that have our church logo on it and all kinds of things about our church. But I always think about that phrase, if, even if you give a cold glass of water to one of these little ones, you will be blessed in my name, right? Um, and so I just would invite you, if you're able to do that, we actually need help with this. Both the de Guzman family and the Head family are away on Thanksgiving morning. So if you're able to, it starts early in the morning. We have more info about this, um, but if you can come and see me at some point today, that would be awesome and I'll get you on the list. Um, just to be involved in that. The second thing is that we also didn't do this last year, but at Christmas time, we're going to do a kids choir, a youth choir. Um, and this is for teenagers down to uh, four or five-ish years old. Um, and this will be for performing and leading worship, not just performing special pieces, but being part of our worship team on December 19th and the day after Christmas, December 26th. Even if you're only here for one of those Sundays, I would love to use you. So if you're interested in doing that, joining the children's choir, or if you know someone who's interested, encourage them to come see me or email me or text me or anything like that, and we'll get you hooked up. Looking forward to doing that together um, because we are a multi-generational church. It's one of the beautiful things about not sending our little children away during this time, but actually including them not only in receiving but also in leading and in worship. Okay, well, we're going to go into our time of fellowship now. We have about seven minutes where we just... We extend the love of Christ to each other. Um, so let's go ahead, greet those around you in the name of Jesus.
Good morning. <laughs> Excellent. All right. It's a privilege to get to stand before you again. It's been a little while. I want to thank uh, Mike and the elders for entrusting me with uh, the responsibility of opening the Word and sharing it with you today. It's uh, always um, a big responsibility, and, um, but it's also a great joy um, to do that. So, well, let's open in prayer. I'm going to um, read as Mike tends to do, and I hopefully you've noticed, he reads scripture in prayer, and then he finishes up with a prayer. I'm going to read some selected passages from uh, Psalm 139 as we bow our heads in prayer, and then I'm going to finish up with a prayer that Mike sent me this morning, okay? So let's close our eyes and open our hearts to God. O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You, have know, you know where I sit down and when I rise up. You understand my thoughts from afar. You scrutinize my path and my lying down and are in intimately acquainted with all my ways. Even before there is a word on my tongue, behold, O oh Lord, you know it all. You have enclosed me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is too high. I cannot attain to it. How precious are your thoughts to me, O oh God. How vast is the sum of them. I should count them. If I should count them, they would outnumber the sand. When I awake, I am still with you. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts. And see if there be any hurtful way in me. And lead me in the everlasting way. God, may your joy be our joy and strength this morning. Please bless your people for the sake of your word and your name. Equip me for the work of the ministry. Let your word take root in me first, that I may sow the seed of your word and others for fruit to spring up for your glory and their good. And we pray all these things in the matchless name of Jesus Christ. Amen. <clears throat> so um, when Mike <clears throat> was looking to go on his trip, he wasn't sure exactly what weeks he would be going. <clears throat> and I volunteered early on when I found out that he was going to need coverage, and he said, that would be great. <clears throat> Which week can you cover? And I told him. And then he said, and then I said, do you know exactly where you're going to be or what you want me to do? He says, no, why don't we do this? Why don't you take John 14, 6? And it's like, okay, sure. And so um, I'm going to be continuing in the I Am series. Um, and it's sort of a blessing and a curse. I have to be honest with you, because we're skipping one, okay? So he gives me the one that is, and let's all say John 14, 6 together, I am the way and the truth and the life. There's three things there. You know I'm a little long-winded, right? <clears throat> um... So, not only that is when you, when you talk on a scripture that everybody knows or have, has heard, they tend to say, they already sort of tone out because I already know this. I've heard this. It's, most people in the wor world have heard that Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. It's Like, okay, so that's one, one thing. I got to keep your interest for a long time and talk about three different subjects. And this is probably one of the most divisive 
scriptures out there for the unsaved. This is why Christians are persecuted. And it's because of what Jesus said in John 14, 6. The exclusivity of it fathers the unsaved are those that are struggling. So that's the other part. So I'm just letting you know we're going to go through it. And the class that we've been teaching in Sunday school, and I appreciate Randy having covered for me for the last several weeks, I've been meditating on this scripture. And we're going to use the principles that we've been learning in Sunday school in the hermeneutics course or how to study the Bible. And I'll be demonstrating some of that here. And in fact, the outline that you have today is based on the principle of that course. So, introduction. What's going on? I want you to turn to John chapter 14. We're actually going to be covering two chapters, John chapter 13 and John chapter 14. And we're actually going to be focusing on the I am statement sort of toward the end, okay? Because I want to get you all in an understanding of what was going on here and, and how it goes. And, and I want you to know that <clears throat> we're going to cover the five W's. Anybody that's um, studied English or journalism or even sales or marketing, <clears throat> when you're out there, you learn what the five W's are. The who, what, when, where, and why. And occasionally it sits on the bench of how. Okay? So we're going to immerse ourselves into the scripture today to find out what's going on exactly to cause Jesus to say this uh, six I am statement. And so uh, look forward to getting into this with you. I want you to know that the setting, where are we in this setting? <clears throat> we are in the upper room, okay? So who is with Jesus when he is going to say this. If you have a Bible that has uh, textual separations, it tells you the topic. So most Bibles these days have that. If you see, in, starting in chapter 13, it's tasked or, or titled the Lord's Supper, right? And it's, but it doesn't go into the bread and the wine, right? It just says that they're having the Lord's Last Supper, and then it goes into Jesus washing the disciples' feet, Jesus predicts his betrayal, and then in chapter 14, it says Jesus comforts his disciples. That's what my scripture has, so I want you to get an idea of what's going on here. It's very interesting in the, cha in the, in the Gospel of John that John focuses so much time and attention on what happened in the upper room. He actually goes from chapter 13 through chapter 17 of the upper room discussion. And it's mostly in red. If you have one of those type Bibles, it's the words of Jesus. Okay, So five chapters of description of what happens. If you look in the other Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you'll see that they cover the upper room time in a very short, just a few verses, okay? And the theme that they, they hit over and over again is the communion, the setting up of the, what we would call the ordinance of the Lord's Supper and introduce that. <clears throat> and they talk about uh, that Peter is going to deny, deny Christ three times before the rooster crows. And that seems to be what the other authors of the Gospels tend to hit on. And then they transition to the time afterwards in the garden and the betrayal of Judas. Okay? Um, so John doesn't do that. John focuses on other things. And he doesn't focus on the communion. 
the thing that he talks about and that we want to get into is um, the various things like washing the disciples' feet. Okay? And so, as I was studying this and looking at all this, it's like, what's going on here? Jesus had come into Jerusalem. We're in Jerusalem at this time. He had come in earlier in the week on what we would call what? Palm Sunday. Okay, thank you very much. Palm Sunday. What happened on Palm Sunday? Jesus rode in on a a donkey, and the people threw their clothes in front of the donkey, and they waved palms, and they said, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. It was a huge parade. It was a huge entrance that Jesus came in. And it wasn't like it was set up before time. You know, um, a favorite team of mine just recently won the World Series, and (laughs) I heard they had a pretty big parade in their town. and that was so big that they had to separate it into two areas, and there was hundreds of thousands of people that were there. The town was very excited. They weren't saying Hosanna, but they were glad that this team had finally won another World Series. Okay? But think of the excitement that the people of Atlanta just experienced with just someone that had won a World Series, okay? And think of Jesus Christ, our Lord, coming into the city of Jerusalem on a donkey and the people being excited because he was there. Why were they excited that he was there? What were they thinking he was going to do? Because he's a Bible teacher, right? How many Bible teachers get a parade when they come into a city? Not many, right? So what were they seeing him as? What were they hoping that he would be? The Messiah, right? Jesus Christ. Christ means Messiah. So that's what they were hoping. And what was their understanding of the Messiah? That he would do what? He would conquer and free them from their Roman rulers. He would overthrow the rulers and would bring Israel back to a powerful nation and prominence and all their enemies would be gone. And their bondage under the Roman Empire would be done. And they had faith that he would do that. Now, was he their Messiah? Yeah. Was his plan the same as their plan? No. So I want you to see how you can have a part of the truth, but you don't always get the full picture. And man's plans are not always the same as God's plans. And let's see how Jesus in this area is educating his disciples. Remember, this is in the upper room. This is within 24 hours of his execution. And I would say just a couple of things. The people were expecting a revolution. And what they got was an execution. They were looking for a superhero, but they ended up getting a sacrificial lamb. How do you get so much so right and then so wrong? Jesus will explain this to us in this passage. So, we're looking at man's way versus God's way. And the first sub-point under that is, how do you lead others? What's man's way of leading? And, And let's get into the scripture here. We're looking at John 13, and we see uh, in verse 5, Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a towel with with which he was girded. And so he came to Simon Peter. And let me just say here, 
Peter is our reflection of how man tends to do things. Peter was so human. And you better not point at Peter because we do the same thing that he does, right? We think the same way. So Peter's going to be the reflection in these chapters of man's view of the world, man's thoughts. And Peter says to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him and said to him, what I do or what I do, you do not realize now, but you will understand hereafter. Peter said to him, never shall you wash my feet. Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, then wash not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, he who has bathed needs only to wash his feet, but it is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. Peter's thought of Jesus is that he's the Messiah. And then when he sees the Messiah, the, the king, taking a towel and doing a servant's job, he really gets upset. That's not our picture of a king, right? Kings rule. Leaders rule. They don't serve they are served, right? That's man's view of how a leader leads. What was God's view? What was Jesus' view? Was he the Messiah? Yeah. What did he do? He showed an example of how a leader should lead. It's become so popular now that in management they teach it as servant leadership. You don't rule by fear. You serve those that work for you and the, the tree of power is actually not a downward pyramid. You flip it over and the leader is at the bottom and he supports all those above him. What does Jesus say as we go on down here to verses 12 through 17? So when he had washed their feet and taken his garments and reclined at the table, again he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, the Lord and teacher, washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I gave you an example that you also should do as I did to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a slave is not greater than his master, nor is one who is sent greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. He is showing us how we are to lead others and how a leader is supposed to work. And this is his, within the last 24 hours of his ministry here on earth. He's trying to teach his disciples how they should live when he's gone, how they should work with each other, how they should support each other. Let's look at the next part. How do you treat others? How do you treat others? There's man's way and there's God's way. Let's look down at verse 21 of John 13. When Jesus had said this, he became troubled in his spirit and testified and said, Truly, truly, I say to you that one of you will betray me. The disciples began looking at one another at a loss to know of which one he was speaking. There was reclining on the Lord's bosom one of his disciples, whom Jesus loved. We know this to be John, the beloved disciple, who actually penned this scripture. And so Simon Peter again gestures to him and said to him, tell us who it is of whom he is speaking. 
he leaned back thus on the Jesus's bosom said to him Lord who is it and Jesus answered then Jesus answered this is the one for whom I shall dip the morsel and give it to him and so when he had dipped the morsel he took and gave it to Judas the son of Simon Iscariot after the morsel Satan then entered into him therefore Jesus said to him what you do do quickly now no, now, no one of those reclined at the table knew for what purpose he had said this to him. For some were supposing because Judas was the money, had the money box that Jesus was saying to him, buy the things that we have need of for the feast, or, or else he should give something to the poor. So after receiving the morsel, he went out immediately, and it was night. Jesus is troubled, and he predicts his betrayer and the betrayal. What would man's response be to that? What do we do if we have intelligence before an action occurs? In the military, we take them out, right? We watch them. We try to prevent what's about bad to happen, keep it from happening. The disciples, what are they doing? They're looking at each other and start not trusting each other and saying, who is it? Peter, that acts like us, is like, finger him. Who is it? I'll go talk with him. I'll take him out, right? That's what Peter's thought is, okay? And what is Jesus? What's God's way? What did God know that they didn't know? Yes, he was going to be betrayed, but for what reason? For our ultimate good. God knows all things. God knows that even when something is meant for evil, God can turn that for good. It was pre-planned. It bothered Jesus, obviously, because he knew it was about to happen, and it was someone he loved. But he allowed it to happen. And as we know in the rest of the story, when the betrayal happened, Jesus, uh, Judas betrayed him with a kiss. Can you imagine the grace that it took to have someone you loved betray you with a kiss? And Judas had the peace of knowing that he could do that with Jesus. So, how do you treat others when you know that they might not have your best interest in mind? Has anything good ever happened out of something bad that someone did to you and you suffered for it, but in the end, it was turned to God's good? Yeah. If Peter had taken out Judas, it's not God's plan. It's not how it works, right? How do people know that you're a Christian? Let's look at Luke 22, 24 through 27, and we'll see man's way of looking at this. Luke 22, 24 through 27. And there arose also a dispute among them which one of them was regarded to be greatest. Who are we talking about here? It's the disciples. Did you realize that at the Lord's Supper, either before or after he had washed their feet, they're having a discussion about who of them 
is going to be greatest in the kingdom. Is that man's way of looking at things? Yeah. Um, I'm more holy than you. I'm closer to God than you are. Um, he called me by my name. I'm one of the select three out of this group. And what did Jesus say? And he said to them, the kings of the Gentiles lorded over them, and those who have authority over them are called benefactors. But it is not this way with you, but the one who is the greatest among you must become like the youngest, and the leader like the servant. For who is greater, the one who reclines at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who reclines at the table? But I am among you as the one who serves. Jesus is always trying to get that human nature out of his disciples. He's always trying to train them in how they should look at situations. And many times as a parent, you do the same thing with your kids, right? I had four boys. They were always trying to one-up each other, right? Who's the greatest, right? They had a pecking order established. It tended to be the oldest to the youngest, right? But it didn't always happen that way because the middle two were pretty close to each other and they could find a way to make it hard on each other, right? So that's what we're always trying to do in our human nature is to say, hey, I'm, I'm pretty good. And the thing is, as Jesus said, the greatest will serve. What, is, what else is in here in John 13, 34 and 35? Jesus gives them a new commandment. Why is he giving them a new commandment now? What does it say? A new commandment I give to you that you love one another, even as I have loved you that you also love one another. By this all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. <clears throat> Not to see who's the greatest, who's in charge, who has the most favor with God, God gives them a new commandment. Jesus says to love one another. <clears throat> now, in the past, he's always said to love one another as you love yourself, right? And that's a pretty high standard because we tend to love ourselves pretty high, well, right? What does he say this time? Love one another even as I have loved you. How much love does that mean? Everlasting, agape love. Self-sacrificing love. That's how you identify God's love, is that it's a self-sacrificing love. What was Jesus about to do on the cross? Die for us. So, these guys keep striking out. <clears throat> number four how do you leave the ones you love what was Jesus doing here let's look in verses 36 <clears throat> through 38 Simon Peter he said to him Lord where are you going because he has said this earlier uh, in verse 33 little children I am with you a little while longer you will seek me and as I said to the Jews, now I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. <clears throat> and then he gives the new commandment. And then Peter, who's always stuck, <clears throat> he didn't learn the new commandment about loving one another, right? He goes back to what Jesus said before that. Um, where are you going? Right? <clears throat> He's focused on that. <clears throat> where I go, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow me later. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? <clears throat> I will lay down my life for you. Then Jesus had to answer him and said, will you lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I say to you, a rooster will not crow until you deny me three times. <clears throat> what, 
When we get bad news, somebody has, let's say, and this is, you know, bad news like uh, inoperable cancer or something like that. You got two ways to respond to it. You can go into denial or trying to find every other way to get out of it, okay? And I'm not saying looking for medications or d new doctors or whatever is wrong in any way, okay? I'm in, that, I'm in that industry, that's what I do. I'm a pharmacist, I'm here to help you make feel better, right? But they're in denial sometimes or they ignore it, right? Jesus is telling them bad news. I'm about to leave, and you're not going to be able to go with me now. And Peter pushed him so hard that he had to basically embarrass Peter and say, Peter, <clears throat> will you really die for me? We know the answer eventually is yes. But at this point, you're not ready. You're actually going to deny me three times. How do you feel? How do you think Peter felt about that? Not good, right? So, as Jesus is leaving them, how does he treat them? He tells them the truth and love, and then he tries to encourage them. So all they've been taught in chapter 13 is that they're not doing right. They need to serve each other. They're not going to be the greatest. The greatest is the one who serves. <clears throat> you don't take out people or look and sus be suspicious of everybody who's going to betray you. You leave that into God's hands. And how do you handle bad news? <clears throat> and Jesus, in chapter 14, tells them how to handle it. And so he encourages and he comforts them. So Jesus comforts and encourages his disciples. So let's look at chapter 14, verse 1. Do not let your heart be troubled. We, we can see from chapter 13 why their hearts might be troubled, right? Their plans, man's plans, are in total opposition to God's plans right now. But don't let your hearts be troubled. Why? Because you believe in God, believe also in me. What is he saying there? Don't be discouraged because I am God. You believe in God? Believe also in me. I am the Messiah. Don't think you have to protect me like a fellow man. Yes, I am the God man. But just because I'm nice doesn't mean I'm vulnerable. I am God. How long did it take some of these disciples to figure this out? After the resurrection, after he came back to them, after he had to show Thomas the holes in his hands and the hole in his side. Some of us are slow learners, right? But he's saying, you believe in God, you can also believe in me. Don't be discouraged. What's the next thing he says? In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. I'm going to stop there. <clears throat> Don't be discouraged because I'm going to prepare a place for you in my Father's house. Who's his father? Joseph? No. No. It's God the Father. That's the ultimate goal. That's, where, that's the ultimate prize. That's where we're trying to all get to, right? We want to be back in fellowship with the Father. And what does he tell us? He says the Father's house 
has many dwelling places. And I'm going there to prepare it for you. I want you to think about something. I've always looked at this from a man's point of view. What does the word prepare mean? I normally think of it as, man, there's a lot of building going on, right? And he's had thousands of years to do this. How long is it going to take? Right? That's sort of our viewpoint, a man's viewpoint on this. What does he mean by prepare? Let me ask you this. Was any man able to enter into the presence of God before Christ rose again, or before Christ was crucified? No. Why? Because of sin. We are eternally separated from God because of sin, unless we have the sacrificial lamb shed his blood as the perfect sacrifice, so as by one man sin came into the world and death by sin, therefore as by one man's obedience to the cross and the sacrifice of him and his blood, it covers our sins so that we can be reconciled to God. So my thought is, I mean, let's just really take this into perspective. How long did it take Christ to speak everything into existence at creation? Six days, right? If you believe that in Genesis chapter 1, right? He spoke it into existence, ex nihilo, out of nothing came everything that we see And he did it in six days. So how long does it take to make heaven? Not that long. Okay. So his preparing is, is preparing the way. He's finishing the journey. He's paying our debt. That's what he's preparing. So don't be discouraged. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And what does he say in verse 3? If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am there you may be also. I am God. Believe in me. There is a heaven with many dwelling places that I'm preparing for you. And thirdly, I'm going to come back and get you. Right? Do you think that would be an encouragement to these guys that aren't understanding exactly what's going on? If it wasn't then, it was afterwards. Right? So, don't be discouraged because I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also, And verse 4, and you know the way where I'm going. Don't be discouraged because you know the way where I am going. Now, this is the one that got him. So one of them speaks up. The one that was probably the most analytical the one that had to have proof of everything. You know how hard it is being named after the Apostle Thomas? I have two disciples' names, Thomas and Andrew. Thomas was first. Oh, the doubting Thomas. Like that's his first name. It's not. He was just very logical. Remember, he wasn't a fisherman. He was a little smarter than that. (laughs) He's trying to figure this out, okay? So, and I'm not picking on all the fishermen in here, just a couple, okay? (laughs) 
All right, so what did Thomas say? Thomas said to him, Lord, he makes a statement. He says, Lord. So Thomas asked for clarification. How many of us ask for clarification when we don't understand something? He was the one that was brave enough. He's the guy in the classroom that is always asking the questions, right? Teacher, eh, you lost me back here, okay? So he's the one that's doing that. So Thomas basically is uh, saying, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How do we know the way? So if we don't know the end destination, how do we know how to get there? If this was a math problem, we don't know what five is, how am I supposed to get to five? All right? Makes sense. He's not doubting. He's just asking a good question. He wasn't a good listener, though, because what did Jesus say earlier? I'm going to my father's house, right? Okay, so now we get in to what Jesus says. Jesus didn't get upset with him. He answered his question in a very declarative statement. He said that he is the way. <clears throat> he is the way. I'm going to use an illustration that some of you might know and some of you might be totally clueless about. And this is for EJ, wherever EJ is. There he is. All right. How many of you like fantasy shows? Has anyone ever heard of The Mandalorian? Okay. How is he going to make The Mandalorian come into the Bible? Okay. <laughs> Follow me. Wait on me. Okay. The Mandalorian is a part of a group he was in, brought into as a young child. The group are basically bounty hunters. I'm telling you the story, okay? He gets a job. He's supposed to kill this mini Yoda guy. Anyone ever heard of Yoda? It's like a little creature. Okay, if you're not there, I'm not going to go into all the details. Anyhow, he's supposed to take out this target, and he has compassion on the target and doesn't take it out because it's a little baby and it's cute, even though it's very ugly. It's cute? Oh, whatever. Okay. So, let's keep going on this story. So, he's trying to find uh, other Yodas. Other, I don't even know what kind of creature it is, but anyhow, he's trying to take this baby back to its family, to its tribe, right? And he's got umpteen people trying to kill him and take the baby and get the money, right? So, in the middle of this series, the writers use this illustration and this saying that the Mandalorian, this group of people use, and, it, and they say it, and it has become very popular. And the saying is, this is the way. And it stops all fights, and they all just repeat it. This is the way. And they go on, and it settles all things because they have a code that they live by, and they call it, this is the way. And now you can buy posters of this with the Mandalorian carrying this little baby Yoda guy. This is the way. I have spoken, right? That's the other one, right? So I'm letting you know that the Mandalorian is not the way. But I want you to learn from this. Great stories, great storytellers use things that our inner nature wants to know and they make it something that we are very curious about and and have an inner desire to know 
the way. How are we supposed to live our lives? What is the, the way we are supposed to live our lives? And so very famous story writers use this symbolism many times. You'll see it in all the best fantasy writers, anywhere from the Tolkien's to the C.S. Lewis's, and I would even submit J.K. Uh, Rowling in the Harry Potter series, uses symbolism to try, and it's why it becomes so popular, because it is, it is an inner desire of all of us to understand how should we live our lives? What is our purpose? And what is the way? So when we see Jesus saying, I am from Exodus, I, capital A-M, I be, ego, be, self-sufficient, I am the way. The way, the path, the road, the journey, that's who Jesus is. Let's look at examples in Exodus 13, 21. This is an Old Testament example that's sort of an illustration of what we're looking at. The Lord was going before them in a pillar of cloud by day to lead them on the way and in a pillar of fire by night to give them light that they might travel by day and by night. This is a Old Testament example of God leading the children of Israel through their journey at day and night and they all they had to do was follow the way led by God either through a cloud or through by a fire let's talk about the way in the New Testament Matthew 7 13 and 14 enter through the narrow gate for the gate is wide, and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who enter through it. For the gate is small, and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few who find it. Mike has talked about this verse before, because we've talked about the gate, right? Or the door. All those that enter in must go through the door or the gate. Jesus, as the shepherd would have slept in the doorway, and he is our good shepherd, he is the way to the Father. And in this, it shows the inclusivity or the exclusivity of this statement. He's the only way, and it's a narrow way way what's the next thing he says he is the truth he's our only knowledge of the way let's look at some scriptures John 1 17 for the law was given through Moses grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. Luke 20, 21. They question him, saying, Teacher, we know that you speak and teach correctly, and you are not partial to any, but teach the way of God in truth. Even his enemies realized that what he said about Scripture was true. They didn't like his answers because it wasn't what they had been taught. But they knew that he taught truth. John 8, 31 and 32. So Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed in him, if you continue in my word, you are truly disciples of mine, and you will know the 
truth and the truth will make you free. If you're truly a disciple of Jesus Christ, you know the truth and the truth will lead you to the freedom. Let's look at John 18. Let me make sure I'm on the right one now. 1837 and 38. This is Jesus before Pilate. Therefore Pilate said to him, So, you are a king? Jesus answered, You say correctly that I am a king. For this I have been born, and for this I have come into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Pilate said to him, What is the truth? And when he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no guilt in him. This is the, this this discussion is really interesting to me. Jesus affirmed that he was a king. He always told the truth. Yes, I am a king. And that's why I came into this world. Pilate, thinking as a man, thinks, okay, he could be a risk, right? Because he thinks he's a king. And Pilate's realm, his paradigm, is that all kings are here on earth, right? So this could be a threat to the Roman Empire, right? And Jesus said, yes, I am. That is true. What you said is true. And I came in here to tell the truth. Pilate says, what is the truth? And then he tries to release Jesus. In postmodernism, which is where we are today, there's this belief that there's no absolute truth. Just believing that is wrong because to believe that, that would make that an absolute truth. Do you all understand that? Because if you believe there is no absolute truth, if you believe that, that would have to be an absolute truth, that there's no absolute truth. Can you see how confused we are when we try to find another way? So if you don't have absolute truth, you have no idea what's going on. And today we try to live with, well, that's true for you. That's your truth. That's your truth. That's your truth. Because we are becoming the I am. Ego, self-reliant one. So when truth is your truth, you are the I am. You are putting your place in God's place. And if we all are doing that, we are a long way from the truth. There's only one absolute, eternal truth, source of truth, and that is the God who is above all gods, and is the God of heaven. He is the truth. And because we can know and trust what he said, because everything he said has come to pass, and he says, if you don't believe me, later on in some verses here, if you don't believe me, believe the works that I did, because that was the Father working through me. He predicted who was going to betray him, right? He predicted that Peter was going to deny him three times. Did Peter do it? Yeah, 
Peter knew what the prediction was, and he still did it. How dumb can you be? He wasn't dumb. God knew he was going to do it, right? We would all be trying to not do it, right? He's not going to be right. I'm only going to do it twice, and I'm done. (laughs) Walk away, Peter. No, he did it. Jesus knew he was going to do it. Come on, folks. He's the truth. I am the way. I am the truth, our only source of knowledge. But he's also the life. So how is this guy that's going to be crucified within 24 hours the life? Right? How does people look at that? If he had stayed in that grave, he might have a point right? But because he is the way, because he is the truth, he is also the source of eternal life. John 1, 4, what does it say? In him was life, and the life was the light of men. John 5, 24, truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. And does not come into judgment, but has passed out of death into life. And then the key verse, the key verse of John, why the whole book was written is John 20, verse 31. And it says, but these have been written so that ye may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life. In his name. As we get to the end here, this is where people have issues. Because he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, they see him as being exclusive. And they're right, he is. But let's look at John 3.16 and see what that says. What does it say? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. He is inclusive of anyone who believes. Anyone who believes that he is the way and the truth will receive the life. But what does John 3.36 say? He who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the Son will not see life but the wrath of God abides on him. It's an either or. It's a up or down. And you have the power to make that decision. Are you going to believe? Are you going to believe in the great I am? Are you going to deny that he is the great I am And put yourself as the I am. I'm self-sufficient. I'm the self-existing one. It's all about me. Or is it all about God? What does Acts 4.12 say? And there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. Who's saying this in Acts 4? Peter, think he learned? He was talking in front of the Sanhedrin. That's all the holy smart people in Jerusalem. 
that had arrested him and John. And Peter got the message. Peter switched from thinking man's way and started thinking God's way. And the Holy Spirit was within him. And even though he was a fisherman, he preached some amazing sermons in the early beginning of the church where thousands came to God. And in this sermon to the Sanhedrin, he says, there is no other name under heaven given among men for us to be saved. It's only through Jesus Christ. How do you apply this message? I just showed you. I just told you. Why did he say it? He wanted his disciples to know. The 11 people that he loved dearly and was about to send out into the world. This is your message, right? Love one another. Don't live like the rest of the world and be encouraged because I am God. Heaven is a real place. My death will make it available to you and you know the way. And you're looking at him right now. So what will you do with Jesus? Pray that you would look about it, consider it. If, if you're saved, live like you're a Christian. Start loving each other like you should. Like God has loved us. And if you're not saved, please come to one of us that's uh, here in the uh, church that can take the scriptures and show you how to, how to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. Thank you. Let's stand together as we contemplate and remember this Jesus who not only shows us the way to live, the way to lead, the way to be a servant, but he also enables us to do so. He becomes the servant for all. He becomes our way. He takes
the way, the truth, and the life that you were directed us in. And when we do that, we actually bring the fellowship that we've experienced here as Christ's body into the world as we expand his kingdom through faith. So my friends, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all.